is a real pleasure for me to introduce our speaker uh, today. Uh, John Hopcroft uh, is a, is a well-known researcher in the area and um, I, in the area of theoretical and computer science. And he's uh, an IBM uh, professor uh, of uh, engineering and applied math at the Cornell University. He, um, he got his uh, master and PhD from Stanford University. And, um, his contribution to theoretical computer science are enormous, um, especially in areas like algorithms, graph uh, uh, theory, and uh, automata theory. And recently he has been working on so, um, topics on information access, information capture and access. And um, his, uh, his list of uh, awards is it's hard to summarize, and, but perhaps I will try to summarize in one way. He's a co-recipient of the Turing Award, which is considered by many as the Nobel Prize of computing, Computer Science. So for us, for, the, uh, for our school, the Computer Science Department, the Math Department, is, uh, we are very honored to have him here talking about some of the challenges of computer science uh, we have to face in the near term. So I let you do a little bit uh, yeah. it, It's a great pleasure for me to be here uh, in Chile and have this opportunity uh, to tell you a little bit about, about computer science. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide my talk into two pieces. Uh, the first half is going to be what we would say sort of is a show and tell. It's kind of I'm just going to show you some pictures and things to try to get a, a message across to you. And then in the second half, what I will do is I will go into some of the research, some of the mathematics that supports the vision of, of the first half. And that way, I hope there'll be a piece of this talk uh, for, that everybody will enjoy. Uh, and I'd like to start out by telling you a very short story about my career, because it's, it's, it's an important uh, part of the message that, that you're going to get. I got my PhD in electrical engineering. And I was hired by Stanford in an electrical engineering department. And I was asked if I would develop a course in computer science. Now, the significance of this may not be obvious at first. It wasn't obvious to me. But because I developed that course, and because there were no computer science departments in the United States at that time, I became one of the country's first computer scientists. Okay, and what this did for me is this gave me fantastic opportunities at an early age, which would never have been available to me if I had been in an area like high energy particle physics. In fact, if I had been in high energy particle physics, I would still be waiting today for the senior faculty ahead of me to retire so that I could have some opportunities. Okay. Now, when I tell this story to students, students say, well, you were just lucky. You happened to be there at the right time. But one of the messages of my talk today is for those of you in computer science and mathematics, you are at the right time. Because computer science is undergoing a fundamental change. And for those people who recognize that and position themselves for the next 30 years rather than the last 30 years, will have fantastic opportunities. So, so let me start out. Uh, so on my first slide, I'm, the point I'm going to make is there's a fundamental uh, changes that are taking place. And this is going to affect everybody's lives. And those individuals who recognize this and position themselves for the future will have many lives like Okay, So the early years of computer science, we were concerned with how to use computers. So we were interested in programming languages, operating systems, compilers, and things of that nature. Now, I don't want to say that those things aren't important, but they're not where the vast majority of people who get degrees in computer science are going to spend their careers. Uh, what has changed is we are all of a sudden discovering that computer science departments are changing their curriculum. And they're talking about things like random graphs, phase transitions, small world phenomena, social networks, and things like that. It's the impact that computers are having in other disciplines that, that are important. And I will just talk about a few drivers of this change. One of the things, computers are becoming ubiquitous. And you're, you're going to find them everywhere. And where people now carry a laptop on a plane, uh, pretty soon computers are going to be so cheap that they're going to be on your desktop and, and, and things like that. 
And speed is sufficient for most of the things we do, unless you're really uh, a scientist working in, in weather prediction or something like that. Uh, your laptop probably has enough computing power to do it, what you want to do. Uh, but one of the important things has been this merging of computing and communications. And it may be that the communications is more important than the computing portion. Also, there's information available in digital form. There are sensor networks. And I'm going to show you just a little bit about how that's going to change your life. And the message that I want you to take away is that the theory that we developed in the last 30 and 40 years, while it supported compilers and operating systems and so forth, what we have to do now is develop the theory to support this new era. And in the last half of the talk, I'll actually show you what I believe some of that theory is. Okay. So <clears throat> I'm going to run through just a, a few slides. Today, if you use Google, you want to buy a car, you'll type in auto, and you'll get 50 pages, and you'll have to search through those pages to get information you want. Same if you wanted to learn about graph theory, you type in graph theory, and you'd have to search the 50 pages. But Google is only the tip of an iceberg. The way we search is going to change drastically. Uh, tomorrow, what you're going to do is you're going to say, which car should I buy? And you would like to get a reasonable answer. Or you would like to be able to say, construct an annotated bibliography on graph theory. I don't want to have to look through all these papers on graph theory to find out which ones are reasonable to read. I'd like to know which are the key ones and what, what is the major uh, uh, content of them. Uh, where should I go to college? I would like to get an answer. And I'll show you what kinds of answers are computer science. You might say, how did the field of computer science develop? And what you'd like to get is you'd like to get back. Who were the key researchers? What institutions were they at? Who did they produce for graduate students? And you'd like this in some pictorial form that gives you a feel for it. You don't want to have to do all of that research from the 50 pages that Google gives back to you. Uh, so if I say, what car should I buy? Uh, what they will probably first ask you is what things are important to you. And they will develop a list. Are you interested in cost, reliability, fuel economy, crash safety? And what will come back after you tell them what you're interested in will be a little table of cars ranked by the criteria that you say. And they'll, they'll list the pertinent articles on the, the particular models they're recommending to you. And uh, so you get consumers report, uh, car and driver, things of that type. Now, you might say that's a little far-fetched, but I'll, I'll give you some slides that will show you that, that that information is available. If you ask, where should I go to college, uh, again, you'll have to say what things are important. And the computer can figure out what things might be important to you by looking at what searches other people have done and accumulating knowledge and, uh, and saying, you know, people tend to think about cost, geographical location, size, are these things important to you? And what you're going to get back is a ranking of programs, and you get information like student-faculty ratios. <clears throat> and you might even get a list of graduates from your high school who went to a specific college and their email address so that you can send them an email and say, well, what is this institution like? How did a field develop? Well, <clears throat> uh, the computer might go to the ISI database uh, this is a database of all journal articles that have been published, and along with the citations, what, what articles they cite. And from this database, you can figure out which are the key articles. So you can figure then out who the important authors are, uh, who the advisors of various PhD students are, the key institutions. And an output might be a directed graph of key papers and how ideas flow from one paper to another. I mean, one of the things, uh, there's a couple of chairs back up in there, I think. A couple over here, if you like. Uh, uh, one of the things that we will want to do is be able to take a document in digital form and extract what are the key ideas of this document and find out when a document introduces a new key idea to a discipline and what other papers build on it. And this is a type of research which is going on today. Uh, just to show you this is not too far-fetched, I'm going to give you an example of what uh, a couple of people did in a few hours. Uh, there is a conference called NIPS, and 
Uh, all of the papers that have been published in NIPS, the conference has been in existence for about 12 years. All of the papers are in digital form, so you can analyze them. And what they did is they sorted all of the papers, and then they put them into like uh, 12 categories. And what they did then is they looked at each category and saw how the number of papers in that category varied with time. And what you can see is the yellow category, uh, <coughs> that particular field looks like it's growing and becoming more important. Uh, same with the light blue. Uh, this bottom category, maybe you better not work in that research area because it looks like it's dying. And just for interest, uh, one, two, the, the little purple one that seems to stay constant. I wondered what that was. It turns out that's a table of contents. <laughs> yeah, that, that. But you can see how just a simple thing of clustering papers allows you to determine which subfields are growing and which are shrinking. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how computing is, is changing your life. So publishing, the way it used to be done, is a researcher would write a paper, would submit it to a journal, six months later would get referees reports back, would revise it, send in a revised version, a couple years later it would appear in print, and then it would be archived in libraries around the world. Okay. Now, I don't know what publishing is going to be in the future because it's undergoing a change, but one of the advice that we gave to young faculty is don't publish in a journal unless that journal allows Google to search it. Okay? You will notice now that every commercial publisher who refu used to refuse to let Google search their journals, now lets Google search them. So the next thing we told uh, young faculty is it's not sufficient just to have Google search the journal because if someone finds your article and then has to pay a fee in order to read it, you're not going to get as many citations as somebody whose article is free. It turns out that every commercial publisher now allows you to put your paper on your own website afterwards. And in fact, Google will find it and people can read your paper free of charge, even though the commercial publisher has the copyright on it. So uh, what I'm saying is there are certain forces that are going to change how publication takes place, how lots of things take place. And understanding what theory is going to be needed to support those changes is important. Uh, another quick example is, is Wikipedia. And uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. If, if I'm preparing a lecture and I can't remember how a proof goes or something, I'll just type the theorem name in Wikipedia, I'll get the proof, and that's all I need. Uh, it turns out it, uh, there was a study done as to the quality of the articles in Wikipedia versus the Britannica, Encyclopedia Britannica. And the conclusion was they were just as good. The only real difference is Wikipedia had about a million articles and the scientific uh, uh, Britannica did not have anywhere near that many. So this, this was just, I, just an example. I typed in Cayley's formula and found out how it was derived. <laughs> uh, you can track things. You can track literally anything. Uh, I'm sure when you purchase something, to, you go online, you purchase it, or if you send your passport in for a visa, you want to make sure when it's coming back and you can follow it as it goes from location to location. And in fact, I even know when it gets loaded on a truck when it's going to get delivered to Cornell University and when it's delivered to Cornell, so I can, I can track it like that. In fact, I used to, uh, my wife used to drive up to Buffalo, which is a city about three hours away, and uh, she would tell me she'd be home at a certain time, and she was always a few hours late, so I kind of wanted some way of tracking her. Uh, it turns out there is a toll road, uh, and we have an electronic way of collecting tolls, and it's called Easy Pass. And what Easy Pass used to do it is when you went through the toll gate, they used to immediately put it on your account. And I knew when she was three hours away, and when she came off the toll road, I knew when she was an hour away. Uh, for some reason now, they, they put a time delay, so that, that doesn't really matter. Uh, I think it was for security purposes yeah. or something. I'm not sure quite why. In fact, it's a little bit of a nuisance because the time delay is three days. And when you go to file an expense report, you can't do it for a couple days because you can't get the receipt. Uh, so what can you track? Uh, you can track every commercial aircraft which is in the air at this moment. And so here's a map of the United States, and those red dots are commercial aircraft. There are about a thousand of them in the air, 
uh, you, if it, I'm sorry, the slide is a little better. You can see waves of them going out to Hawaii. And for some reason I don't understand is every hour three planes take off from San Francisco for Hawaii. And then there aren't any planes taking off, but exactly an hour later there are three. Mm -hmm. So you see little waves of planes going. Uh, you can see planes going up the coast of, uh, of Alaska, heading off to Asia, and you can see planes heading off to, off to Europe. And um, uh, if my wife wants to know when I'm going to get home, uh, because if she calls the airline, they don't seem to have reliable information. Mm. Uh, so what she just does is she just Googles the flight I'm on. And, uh, so here it's going from New York to San Francisco. It's, it's still two and a half hours away. She, she knows it'll be a while before I, before I get there. Uh, but there's a lot more information here than you may think. You know, just determining where an aircraft is isn't too much. But suppose you wanted to track a hurricane coming up the coast of Florida. It turns out you can deduce that from this website because the airplanes start to reroute. And by watching over time how these airplanes reroute, you can determine what the weather is. And the important message there is these databases have tremendous amounts of information that you don't understand is there. And that's going to be the, the future. Another way to track a hurricane, by the way, is the amount of blog activity. Because as the hurricane is coming along, people are typing into their blogs. And by watching this activity, you can actually do it. Um, yeah, so, so you can just track uh, all, all kinds of things. So I was out in Seattle. <clears throat> and there's a mountain pass called Snoqualmie Pass, and uh, I want to go up there. My son has a cottage up there. And I was talking to my wife, and she said, you know, we have a rental car. We don't have tire chains. We don't have snow tires. Are you sure we ought to go? Now, in the past, what I would have done is I would have called our state patrol and asked them what the conditions were at the pass. But now what you do is you Google Snoqualmie Pass, and you find a camera which is pointed at the road surface, and you look at it, and you see it's a sunny day, and it's clear. And I showed it to Judy, and she said, fine, let's go. <laughs> so sensor networks are going to play an important role. Um, uh, I was staying north of Seattle, and the airport is south of Seattle, and Seattle is a narrow city. And I asked someone, how long is it going to take me to get to the airport? And they said anywhere from 20 minutes to an hour and a half, depending on traffic. So what do I do? I googled I-5, which is the major road, and looked at it at various places along the way, and noticed that the traffic, there was very light traffic, and so I could probably do it in 20 minutes. I, I gave myself an hour, but uh, you can do it. But imagine this now. In the future, uh, cars are going to be integrated with the road, and the car is going to communicate to the road how fast it's moving. And the road is going to communicate what the speed limit is and what the weather conditions are. When you come to a bridge which says bridge surface may be icy, uh, that those road signs are going to disappear. You're going to be given a message in your car where it'll tell you whether there actually is ice on that road surface. The road surface on a bridge freezes faster than the road surface is in general because uh, there's no earth underneath and, uh, and things like that. But if there's an automobile accident, and all of a sudden traffic stops, the road is going to notice that cars that were going 70 miles an hour are not moving. It'll send a message to authorities to get emergency equipment there. It'll send messages back upstream and say, look, uh, there's a problem ahead. Maybe you want to leave this interstate and take a, another road. And your uh, uh, guidance system in your car then will replan your route and say take this exit, this road, this road, and we'll get you around the, the traffic accident. And that's all going to be integrated. And that's what's going to take place in the next 10, 15 years. And there's a lot of scientific issues involved in making that happen. So uh, this was a little experiment that we did. Uh, it, it turns out that there are a lot of people in the United States that are bird watchers. And what they do, there's an ornithology lab at Cornell, and people go out and they watch birds and they tell the time, the place, and the species of bird, and there are millions of bird sightings. And so what a graduate student of mine did is we asked from these bird sightings, could we deduce how the, what the bird migration paths were? And so he constructed a mathematical model 
uh, use the data from the ornithology lab to get the parameters of the model. Uh, this was a hummingbird, uh, which starts out uh, down in the Yucatan uh, in the early spring. And as it migrates up north, which is the, the slide farthest to the left, uh, some of them, the birds fly across the Gulf of Mexico, and some take a land route around the side. Uh, then they move farther up into North America, and then late to start in the fall, they start returning. But when they return, they don't fly across the Gulf of Mexico. <laughs> they all take the land route. And after we got this, we asked ornithologists, is, is this right? And they said, as far as we know, uh, you've got the right answer. But it turns out that we can give the ornithologists answers which are better than what they know today. At least they, they feel that we have more information about bird trajectories than they do from uh, their, their work. Okay, so that was, the, that was sort of the first half of the talk. That was to tell you that the world is changing. And what we have to do is we have to create the science base that is going to be needed to support that. So let me talk in general terms about the science base, and then I will actually go in and I will, it will show you what I mean by science base by putting the mathematics of some topic in there. Okay, so kinds of things which are probably going to be important are large graphs. I mean, if you want to model the uh, internet, something like that. Uh, spectral analysis, you're going to deal with high dimensional data and dimension reduction. Uh, clustering, uh, collaborative filtering uh, is a topic that says, how do I target an ad to you based on one purchase? How can I possibly know what you'd want to buy? Well, it turns out there's a theory that supports that, and it does pretty well. Uh, and you're going to be trying to extract signals from noise. And I guess one of the things I should have put on there that I didn't, but you're going to look at large data sets, and you're going to create a mathematical model underneath, and then you're going to analyze that model underneath to determine things, to extract information. That seems to be a common theme, one of the common themes that's coming up. Okay. So the graph theory that I studied in, in the 50s, graphs were things that you could draw on a sheet of paper. They had 5, 10, 15 nodes and 20 edges or something like that. And a typical theorem was this, a graph is planar if it does not contain a Kurkowski subgraph as a contraction. And what was interesting about the theorems that I learned is if you added an edge to a graph or deleted an edge, uh, whether it had a given property or not would change. Okay, But that's not going to be important today. Uh, we have large graphs with billions of vertices. And the exact edges that are present are not critical. And any theorem which depends really on the exact edges is probably not an interesting theorem. Okay. So we've got to develop a theory of large graphs uh, Maybe it's a theory of graph generation, and it's got to be invariant to changes, at small changes in the graph, and we're going to have to be able to prove some basic theorems. And so uh, I'll show you the start. Uh, Eric and Rainey came up with a model for a random graph where they put down n vertices, and then for each pair of vertices, they flipped a coin, which would come down heads with some probability, and if it came down heads, they put the edge in, otherwise they left it out. So one of the theorems that you could prove is that the degree distribution, uh, the graph would have a binomial de degree distribution, and the, the degree of a vertex would be uh, very closely aligned with the expected value. It would be concentrated about the expected value. Okay. So that was a beautiful theorem. There's a lot of theorems like that. But there was a difficulty. Somebody went out and looked at a real graph. <clears throat> so this is a United Airlines uh, route graph. And if you look at the degree distribution, here are cities or nodes, and if there's a direct flight between two cities, there's an edge. If you look at the degree distribution, that's certainly not tightly concentrated about the expected value. So, so what's wrong? Uh, we have to come up with a better model. And so uh, what people have done is they've generated, they've looked at a generative model for graphs, and all you, what you're going to do is you're going to start out with one vertex, and at each unit of time you add a vertex and a few edges, and all you have to do is tell me how you're going to add the edges. And one way is you could just add them uniformly at random, pick two, two vertices, put the edge in. Another way is you could use preferential attachment. Uh, in other words, when you go to pick the two vertices to connect with an edge, 
pick them with a probability proportional to degree. And if you use the preferential attachment, you will get a power law degree distribution, which is what real graphs happen to have. So you'll get a degree distribution like that. So let me just give you another experiment to do with graphs. When I teach uh, an undergraduate course uh, in this area, what I do is I tell the students to go out on the web and find any database they want that they can convert to a graph. So for example, I found one on proteins. There are 2,730 proteins, and certain <coughs> proteins interact. And it's not important what an interaction is, but the database said there were 3,602 interactions between pairs of proteins. So then what I do is I say, construct the graph. So each vertex is a protein, and there's an edge of two proteins interact. And find the number of components. Okay. So you start, and you see that uh, components of size 1, there were 48. Size 2, there were 179. We got out to 16, there was 1. We may have looked out to size 1,000 and didn't find any more between 17 and 1,000 and quit. But then we added up the number of vertices which were in these components, and we noticed we were missing now almost 2,000 of them. <laughs> so we looked a little longer, and we found this component of size 1,851 and obviously called a giant component. And your first reaction is, wow, that's kind of weird. But when we tell students to take any database you want and do this experiment, you will find the same phenomenon. You'll find there is one giant component out there. Okay? Why is that? There must be some mathematical theory that explains this. And in fact, you can, you'll see why very easily. Uh, you can create some synthetic data. Why not put down a thousand vertices and randomly add an edge one by one, and every time you add an edge, calculate the, the, the number of, of components of various sizes. And I'll just show you what happens. So the first, when you start out, you know, the components are of size one when there are no edges, and there's a thousand of them. You put the first edge in, uh, you get one component of size two, and there's only 998 of size one. You put in a few more, and it starts to look like that next slide. And then this middle group, and then you notice they're starting to get some medium-sized components. And then all of a sudden, all the medium-sized components get swallowed up into a giant component. And now it's probably obvious why. When you go to put an edge in, if there's a relatively large component, there's a fairly good chance that you're going to pick a vertex in that component. And these large components all of a sudden merge, and that's what forms the giant component. So it's phenomenon like this that, that you're going to want to study. Uh, this is, is something I took from a, a paper that was published in, uh, by researchers in IBM Almaden. Uh, this was the World Wide Web, but it had only 200 million vertices. Uh, by the way, the World Wide Web now has 20 billion, just to give you an idea of the scale. But what happens, this is a directed graph. And so now you're going to find strongly connected components rather than components. And there is a giant strongly connected component that had 56 million vertices for about a quarter of the, of the graph. And then there's uh, a number of vertices from which you can reach that strongly connected component but cannot get back, and so on. And this graph is what you will get if you take any random directed graph. Something else that happens is if you have any combinatorial structure and you have any monotone property, and I'm not going to go ahead and tell you exactly what a monotone property is, but like if I increase the number of edges in a graph, all of a sudden the graph goes from not having the property to having it. Uh, that's what monotone is. Turns out there will be a phase transition. The change in the, from the value of your parameter to go from not having the property to having it, from the probability going from 0 to 1, will happen with a very small change. It'll be just like water boiling or, or water freezing, something like that, called phase transition. And it happens in every combinatorial structure. You can prove that. So these are things that you have to start to understand. Okay. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how search is done. Uh, there's something called smart technology. If you have a document, the way to, one way to represent it in the computer is to take all the words in the document, sort them into alphabetical order, and count the number of occurrences of each word. 
So this, this document, Artifark, uh, did not appear, so I put down zero. Abacus did not appear, so I put down zero. Antitrust appeared 42 times, CEO 17, Microsoft 61, Windows 14. I bet you already know what the document is about. Uh, it's, it's, it's obvious from the vector what, what the document is. So, so the way documents are represented is as a vector, and if you want to search for a document, you take your query and do the same thing, and then you take the dot product of two vectors, and if the dot product is close to one, uh, the document is, is close to your query. Or if you want to know if two documents should be clustered, if their dot products of their vectors are close to one, they're similar topics. Okay. So, let's go ahead. Uh, so I did a query. I was looking for Boolean gates. These are things electronic circuits are put together. And I didn't think, I just typed in the word gates. And what I got back was two million hits. Now, I clustered them, and you notice there's half a million on Bill Gates, 200,000 on Gates County. I didn't even know there was a Gates County. <laughs> uh, Baby Gates was close to 200,000. But Boolean Gates are only 19,000. Now, no matter how you ordered those 2 million, imagine how far I would have had to go on down that list to find one that I was interested in. So what you clearly want to do is you want to cluster them and then subcluster them because I can immediately then jump into the cluster that I want and, and get in. So, so these are things we're going to be able to want to do. But clustering is not that obvious because how do you measure distance between entities? You might want to cluster books by their subject, whether it's math, physics, chemistry, or astronomy. But on the other hand, you may want to classify them by how their level, whether they're children's books, textbooks, reference books, or books for the general population. And so there are many different ways of clustering. And how, how do you detect clusters, and how do you detect distances, and, and things of this type, and understand that.